Let's have a word of prayer before we begin. Father, we thank you tonight. We praise your name for bringing us together. Thank you for your people, our workers, our leaders, everyone. We're asking, Lord, that your spirit will expand, expatiate your word to everyone tonight in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, that the truth of your word will penetrate every heart, will grow, will move on, will move up, will progress in your word, in the truth, in the ministry of the word in Jesus' name. We pray we'll know you more, we'll serve you more, and we will trust you more. We'll be faithful more and more in Jesus' name. We pray that we'll not take your word for granted, that every part of your word, every revelation of your word, will profit every one of us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 4 all through to verse 10. From verse 4, 1 Samuel chapter 3. That the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I. For thou calls me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I. For thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood and called, as at all the times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. As we look at the life of Samuel, who became a mighty prophet in the land of Israel. We learn quite a lot of how to grow and how we can grow from a beginner to a builder. That is, we start at the level of knowing nothing. Samuel did not know the voice of God. He did not know that God was calling him. But we can see his faithfulness. We can see his devotedness. We can see his consecration. We can see his obedience. He thought at that hour of the night that Eli was calling him. And he will not grudge Eli. And he will not wonder why Eli should call him at such a time. But he went, Eli said, I didn't call you. He went to lie down. And the voice of the Lord came again, and he thought it was still Eli. But I went before, and the old man said, I'm not calling you. But he went, dutifully, faithfully, without any grudging. 
And Eli said, I didn't call you. And he went the third time again. He had a good beginning. And he had a good final end. Look at Psalm 99. As we read from verse 6, Psalm 99, verse 6. Here we're looking at who else God mentioned along with Samuel. Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among them that call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, they, Moses, Aaron, Samuel, they called upon the Lord, and the Lord answered them. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 32. Hebrews 11, reading from verse 32. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. You will see how Samuel made progress from a beginner, as I said, so when he came to his old age. And looking at the life of Samuel, looking at the ministry of Samuel, looking at the priesthood of Samuel, looking at the prophetic progress of Samuel, we're looking at the message tonight, growing from a simple convert to a spiritual giant. It's applicable to you, applicable to me. We start at the beginning as a simple convert. And if we follow through, like Samuel followed through, we can become a spiritual giant. If you will follow attentively, and if you will follow devotedly, and if you will follow with all the consecration you can offer to the Lord, you can move from being a simple convert to becoming a spiritual giant. In our house fellowships, in our little fellowships in the local church, in our district churches, there are quite a lot of Samuels there, a lot of beginners there, a lot of people who have started at the lowest level. If we ourselves knew how to move on, how to move on in the spirit and move on in the word of God and move on in the teaching, training, transformation that the Lord himself is giving us, we can move from, we can move the people from being simple converts to becoming a spiritual giant. Tonight, growing from a simple convert to a spiritual giant. What that means is this. Number one, we grow from a convert to a conqueror. So that we're not all the time, all our lives, being defeated by whatever trial, whatever temptation, and whatever challenges may come upon us. We're moving on, starting from being a convert, and we move on to becoming a conqueror. Number two, it means starting from the level of a child, and moving on to becoming a champion. A child that knew nothing, a child that had no skill, a child that had no understanding, but we do not remain a child. We move from being a child to being a champion. Number three, as we talk about growing up from being a simple convert to being a spiritual giant, we mean number three, growing from a learner to a leader. You start learning 
even the alphabets of the Christian life, the alphabets of the Christian ministry, the very rudiments of what it means to work with the Lord. And yet you are not always at that level. You're moving from being a learner to being a leader. Number four is going from a babe to a, a builder. A babe that didn't even know the name of the street where you live when you were a baby. You didn't even know that they called this a building. You didn't know they called anything a temple, a sanctuary. But from a babe that knew nothing about blocks, about cement, about carpentry, about anything, eventually you become a builder. I see builders before me. I said, I see builders before me growing from being a simple convert to becoming the spiritual giant means number five, you go from a novice to a nobleman. A novice to a nobleman. As a novice, you are not even qualified to handle anything in the house of God, in the work of God, in the ministry. But then, there is growth systematically going on from day to day, from week to week, from year to year. And you're no more a novice, but to become a noble man, a noble woman. It means, number six, you're growing from grace to godliness. From grace to godliness. All you can say when you are born again, thank you, Lord, for the grace. Thank you for the grace. Give me more grace. Multiply your grace. Increase your grace. But now you're moving from that level of grace. You're moving on to godliness. Number seven, you're moving from godliness to glory. Godliness to glory. Now everything you do, you think and you consider the very glory of God. This must be to the glory of God. Something simple, something common, something ordinary, something challenging, whatever it is, you say, my aim, my goal, my pursuit is that and it's not only that I'm just godly in my personal private life, there is glory for God. Number eight, you're from the beginner to a finisher. A beginner to a finish. There was a day that Paul the Apostle began. The Lord called him. And then he moved on until he could say, I have finished my course. Those are the people that do not faint in the middle of the road. Those are the people that do not give up when challenges come, when a lot of stormy, raging water passes under the bridge. And as they begin, eventually they finish. You have started well, you will finish well. I will finish well. I said, I will finish well. Growing from a simple convert the spiritual giant. Three things we're looking at. Number one, Samuel's conversion and conviction through prayer. Samuel's conversion and conviction through prayer. Point number two, his steadfast consecration and commitment to purity. His steadfast consecration and commitment to purity. Point number three is solemn commission and courage as a prophet. In brackets, after that prophet, you put preacher. It was really a preacher, a preacher. A solemn commission and courage as a prophet preacher. We're coming to point number one now. Samuel's conversion and conviction through prayer. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, 1 Samuel, let's back up to chapter 1. 1 Samuel chapter 1, and see the beginning of this Samuel, who became a giant, a mighty prophet in the land of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 1, 
I read from verse 26. And she said, as the mother, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have lent him unto the Lord. As long as he liveth, it shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord there. You might not have noticed some subtle things hidden within those verses. The mother had kept the child until the child was weaned, until the child could now stay alone away from the mother. And the mother obviously had been talking to the child. This is how you were born. This is how you were conceived. You were conceived by prayer. You were born through prayer, and your life will be based on prayer. I got you through prayer, and the only way you can make it in life is to follow after the prayer pattern and the prayer life of your mother. And I'm going to, I've already promised the Lord, actually, your name is called Samuel, because I got you from the Lord and I'm going to hand you over to the Lord. It's one thing for the mother to consecrate. It's another thing for the child to accept that consecration and to link up with that consecration. It's one thing for Abraham to be willing to offer Isaac. It's another thing for Isaac to totally surrender and to totally yield to the consecration of Abraham and accept to be sacrificed unto the Lord. It is in that consecration and that decision which the mother had taken that Samuel accepted, that Samuel surrendered to. That's where his conversion came in. That now when the mother handed him over unto Eli and said, Eli, I'm not giving the child to you, I'm giving the child to God. And as long as he lives, the mother did not have any other child at this time, but as long as he lives, he will be laid permanently unto the Lord and Samuel accepted to be offered unto the Lord. And Samuel rejoiced to be offered unto the Lord. And Samuel consecrated himself and said, Lord, my mother said I belong to you. It is not just what my mother has said. I also say I belong to you. I give myself to you. He had a conversion. Look at the last line of verse 28. And he worshipped the Lord there. It's not talking about Eli. It's not talking about the mother, Anna. It's talking about the boy. And he, Samuel, worshipped the Lord. Look at chapter 2 now. In chapter 2 of First Samuel, I'm reading from verse 17. Second uh, chapter, verse 17. Wherefore, the sin of the young men, those are the sons of Eli. Their sins were very great before the Lord. And for men abhorred, and men uh, detested the offering of the Lord. But Samuel, he had a different life. He had his own personal conviction. He had his own personal decision. He had, his, he had his own personal devotedness unto God. And whatever others did will not move him. He, they were older than himself. They were the sons of the priest, the sons of the high priest. And they were already ministering before he got there. 
but he had his mind, his eyes, his focus, his will centered on the Lord. And but Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, guarded with a linen effort. Look at verse um, in verse twenty one. Verse 21 says, And the Lord visited Anna so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. That's not just, you know, not just talking of physical growth, spiritual growth. It's consciousness of who God is. Let's look at verse 26. In verse 26, and the child Samuel grew on. He grew. Now he grew on. And he was in favor with the Lord and also with men. You will see how his life progressed. Chapter 3, we're looking at verse 15. In chapter 3, verse 15, and Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here I am, here am I. And he said, What is the sin that the Lord has said unto thee? I pray thee, hide did not from me. God do so to thee. And more also, if thou hide any sin from me, of all the things that he said unto thee. And Samuel told him every witch. No addition, no subtraction, no cutting up, no adjustment, nothing of craftiness or cunning. He told Eli every witch and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. As you follow the life of Samuel, you can see that although you may not know the time, you may not know the place, but you will know a definite conversion experience had taken place. The life shows that. The distinction of his life, the difference in his life showed that, that a conversion had taken place. Conversion is very important. Transformation of heart, transformation of life, very important. Look at Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, reading from verse 7. Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The environment was not perfect. Eli was not perfect. The sons were really polluted. They were not perfect. Temple worship was not perfect. But the law of the Lord is perfect. Whatever the condition of the preacher, whatever the condition of Eli, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And that was the privilege that Samuel made use of. I won't look at the life of Eli. It's not my place to judge him. God even reveals something to me about him. That's not my business. He told me to tell him. I told him. I didn't have told anything. And the response was not the best of responses. Instead of repenting, instead of calling his son to attention, he said, okay, God is God. Let him do what he will do. I'm not looking at that. He was basing his life on the law of God. And the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Uh, there are some people that use um, uh, some churchgoers as their excuses. 
I know so and so is not living well, that's why I'm not converted. I know these children, they are not doing right, that's why I'm not converted. That's just an excuse. The law of the Lord is there. The copy of the Bible is in your hand. The word that will not fail is in your hand. The law of the Lord is perfect. That's what converts the soul. Psalm 51, reading from verse 12. Psalm 51, we're reading from verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. That's the purpose of us being saved. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And once I have that assurance of salvation, I will teach sinners your way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. That's why you are a worker. That's why you are here. That's why you are ministering to children like Samuel, children like Josiah, children like joseph children like jeremiah that's why you are ministering to them then will i teach transgressors thy ways and sinners even children shall be converted unto thee that's why you're a youth leader that's why you're a woman leader you yourself you have assurance of salvation and there you declare the transforming word of Christ, of God, of grace unto the people. And then you lead them to conversion. And conversion, without conversion, all else is useless, worthless, and will not profit us for the kingdom. Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, we're reading from verse 3. Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become like little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Except our members in the house fellowship are converted, we're wasting time, we're wasting life. We're wasting resources. We're wasting our ministry. We're wasting our skill. Except our members in the local churches and in the groups and in the region, in the state, except our members are converted, we're wasting their time. We're wasting our own time too because they will not get into the kingdom of heaven. And the life of Samuel teaches us that no matter how bad their environment may be, no matter how defiled, how corrupt, how polluted the environment may be, some of, uh, sometimes some of the women might tell the woman leader, you know, I really can't uh, make any progress spiritually. You know why? My mother in the Lord. The reason is because my husband is terrible and the children are terrible and the situation is terrible my dear sister she doesn't have any excuse the community in which samuel grew up and the house in which he lived and the temple in which he ministered was corrupt and polluted and evil and defiling Yet Samuel was converted, and except he be converted like that little child Samuel, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. We are not sympathizers, we are preachers. We are not to sympathize with, you know, the women and the children and the members and the men who are in our fellowship and say, I understand their condition. Things are terrible. He just lost his job and he just lost this, he just lost that. And the community is evil. And because of that, what do we expect? Well, Samuel could have given a lot of excuses. But 
that young Samuel was converted. That's what the Lord is telling us, that we ourselves should not make any excuse why I am not making spiritual progress, why I am not sanctified, why I am not filled with the Holy Ghost, why I am not committed, why I am not this, I am not that. It's because of environment, it's because of community. No, Samuel did not give any excuse. Well, will not give any excuse. You will not give any excuse. Conversion is very important. Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 19. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. That's the only way conversion takes place. If we enjoy our sins, we cannot be converted. If we embrace our sins, we cannot be converted. If we remain in our sins, we cannot be converted. If we look at other people, look at them. They have liberty. They can do whatever they want to do. Their father, Eli, does not correct them. They, have, they take laws into their hands and nobody can say anything to them. I want to be as free as they are. You'll never be converted under that condition. It's when you make up your mind, others may me i will not others me i cannot others me i will not i will not i must not i cannot whatever others do whatever liberty they take however corrupt they might be and whatever line they want to follow i want to center my affection on god and I want to be totally given to the Lord, surrendered to the Lord, abandoned to the Lord. That's how we get converted. Repent ye therefore. Don't make any excuse. Repent ye therefore. Don't say, if they can do it, why can't I do it? You are born separate from them. You came into the world apart from them. And when you leave this world, you will face the judgment of God all alone by yourself. Always think about that. Whatever others do, I must yield and surrender completely to the Lord. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Verse 26, unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquity. Turning away everyone from his iniquity. And you can tell as you look at the life of Samuel that he had number one, conversion. Number two, he had conviction. What kind of conversion did he have? Number one, he had early conversion. Early conversion. He didn't wait until older years when he will be hardened in sin. He didn't wait until older years when he would have sold wild oats. He didn't wait until when he would have become habitual and rigid in evil. He had an early conversion. Can you have an early conversion? Yes. Whatever age you are, the moment the word of God comes to you, there is but just one thing to do, just obey, just obey. Number two, he had exceptional character. Exceptional character for a child growing up. I mean, uh, a high level of immorality, high level of corruption, high level of pollution, and yet to make himself different, distinct, and distinguished, he had an exceptional character. Number three, add exemplary conversation. Exemplary conversation. You know, the tongue can sell you out. The tongue can reveal who you are. And your tongue, your conversation, your discourse, the things you share with other people, and the things you love to hear. If you love to hear dirty stories, huh? 
Confession is not there. If you like to hear immoral tales, confession is not there. If you like to hear stories that will pollute your mind, stories that will drive you, draw you to wanting to do evil, true conversion is not there. But this uh, young child had exemplary conversation. Number four, he had an enlightened conscience, an enlightened conscience. You see, there are people, if they say they are converted, their conscience, they don't carry their conscience along. Whatever they do, wherever they go, the conscience is not acting like a sharp-sighted policeman inside them, cautioning them, correcting them, and correcting them. But you see, this young man, young child, he had an enlightened conscience. While the Ophni and Phinehas, what they were doing, what they were doing, his conscience will say, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. God has not changed. The word of God has not changed. The expectation of God has not changed. That's wrong. His conscience was enlightened. He had number five, evident consistency. Evident consistency. You see, there are people, they are up, they are down. They are righteous, they are righteous. They stand, they fall. They're strong, they're weak, not some of them. Consistency in his character. Consistency in his comportment. Consistency in his conduct. The arch, evident consistency. You know, as a Jewish child, every child that is born in the land of Israel, a boy must be circumcised. And although you cannot tell the day of the circumcision, but we know he was circumcised because that was the regular scene, the normal scene in Israel. But you know what we discover? That Samuel did not have just the ordinary, regular circumcision. He had heart circumcision. You can tell the evidence is there. As you come to the Lord, you are saved. Your sins are cleansed. Your sins are taken away voluntarily by yourself. Like it happened unto Samuel. You go to the altar again. You go to the cross again. You go to Christ again. Circumcise my heart. Number seven, he adds heavenly commendation. Heavenly commendation. The Lord pushed Eli aside, and the Lord will not talk to Ophni and Phinehas, but the Lord will talk to Samuel. And even when Samuel did not know it was God calling, and he went to Eli, God called again. And even though Samuel still did not know, God did not say, well, he doesn't understand, let me now talk directly to Eli. He called Samuel again. And for the first time, he called Samuel again. He had heavenly commendation. His conversion, is, there's no doubt about it at all. It's not debatable. It's not refutable. Not only that, he had conviction. You can tell. If a person is living in a corrupt society, but he remains like a white lily, growing up from the dirty mud, and the stain of the soil of the mud is not on the white lily. That's what you're talking about, conversion. Samuel had, number one, earnest conviction. Earnest conviction. His conviction was not dull, dim, and his conviction was not something you cannot see. He distinguished himself. The question is for you now. What conviction do you have? In your office, what conviction do you demonstrate? In your home, what conviction do you demonstrate? Among other workers in the church, other leaders in the church, are you like, you know, dead fish flowing with the river? Or do you have an earnest conviction? Number two, he had 
entire consecration. There was no area of his life that was not given to God. He didn't say, well, mother, give me to God, lend me to God. That, that's mother. But now I'm going to withdraw my heart. I withdraw my skill. I withdraw my faithfulness. I withdraw my loyalty. Everything he had, he surrendered everything, entire consecration. He had an enriching communion, communion with God, communion with God. That's what we read in Psalm 99, verse 6. Samuel among the people that called upon the Lord that prayed. And God answered them. He had a reaching communion. How, how enriching is your communion with God? Do you talk to men more than you talk to God? Are you confident of talking to neighbors more than you talk to God? When you talk to God, do you have the consciousness? You are really communicating and you are really talking you know, unto the Lord. Samuel at that, a reaching communion. Number four, he had entrusted commission. The Lord could entrust something you know, into his son. And the Lord did not allow any of his word to fall to the ground. That man distinguished himself. And that man said, I am totally for the Lord. And the commission he has given me, I hold firm and I cherish it. He had entrusted commission. He had number five, an established calling. An established calling. And all the people of Israel knew that God had made Samuel a prophet. His calling was established. Is your calling established? Or any time you are not around, nobody knows you are not around. Nobody feels you are not around. No, nobody resists any qualm, anything because you are not around. Do we feel your absence when you are not there? And do you yourself feel you are like fish outside water when you are not there? Do you have an established calling? Number six, he had enduring courage. Enduring courage. Look at the message he received as a child. And he had to give that to Eli. And it's about Eli and his sons. And about the judgment that will come upon Eli. Ah, people don't like you talking about their children. And people don't like you talking to them about the waywardness of their children. And how can I talk to him about the children and about what God had said? There are preachers who are afraid. They cannot talk to the children. The children may react. They cannot talk to the youths. The youths may react. They cannot talk to the parents. The parents may react. They cannot talk to anybody in the church. And they cannot be direct to correct anything. Because they are so much timid. And they are so much afraid. If I talk, it will look like I am criticizing them. And they will fight me. They cannot stand for God. They cannot stand for righteousness. In the case of Samuel, he could stand. You will stand. I said you will stand. He had an enduring courage. Number seven, he had enlarging contribution. If you watch the ministry and the life of Samuel, as he grew from year to year, his ministry, his contribution to the kingdom, his contribution to the progress of the nation spiritually, was expanding and enlarging and growing. That's what the Lord wants of you. That's what he wants of me. That's what he wants for everyone, that you'll have an enlarging contribution. An early conversion, an exceptional character, an exemplary conversation, an enlightening conscience, an evident consistency, heart circumcision, heavenly commendation, earnest conviction, 
entire consecration, enriching communion, entrusted commission, established calling, enduring courage, enlarging contribution. The Lord reproduce everything in your life in Jesus' name. I said, the Lord will produce all this in your life in Jesus' name. Point number two now is steadfast consecration and commitment to purity. We're coming back to 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, 1 Samuel chapter 2, we're reading from verse 21. This passage is showing us what was around him as he was growing up, and the life he lived as he was growing up, and the distinction, and the standing, and the integrity as he was growing up. For Samuel chapter 2, reading from verse 21. In verse 21, for Samuel chapter 2, it says, And the Lord visited Anna, so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. Look at this. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Before the Lord. This young man, this young child, was always conscious, I live my life before the Lord. I say what I say before the Lord. I attend to the temple worship before the Lord. I interact with Eli and anyone before the Lord. I take all my decisions before the Lord. He was conscious of the presence of the Lord every time. And so he was growing before the Lord. Let everything you do be a conscious demonstration that are always before the Lord. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how delay was the women terrible that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. It was open sin, open scandal, open corruption. And yet Samuel was not influenced by all that open pollution, defilement, corruption. And he said unto them, that the father talking to them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings with all these people. As bad as the situation was, Eli was such an indulgent father. He couldn't discipline the children. He could, but he didn't. And he didn't remove them from office. And he allowed his children in fornication and adultery, defiling the worshippers. He allowed them to continue like that. But Samuel will not look in that direction. Are there preachers? Are there pastors, are there ministers in our church who know that their children are living literally in fornication, in adultery, and those children are still under their roof, under their care, and they know, but like Eli, they will not do anything. And other members of the church know the says, Pastor's son, pastor's daughter, they say his overseer's son, overseer's daughter, they will not do anything. And there are people that will say, okay, if overseer's son is doing that, if overseer's daughter is doing that, and they're not checking them, and they're still in the choir, they're still here, they're still here. How about me? Why am I punishing myself? Samuel did not think it was punishment for him. He was living his life before the Lord. The Lord will judge every Eli who will not judge their children. I want to hear a good amen. It's not right. It's not right. For the child of a minister, 
the child of a leader, the child of a pastor, the child of anybody in the church to be defiling other people and sending them to hell and then we fold our hands, they will not hear from my mouth. They will not hear any story from me. You are an accomplice, you are part of them. When the judgment comes, it will fall on you as well. Nay, my sons, verse 24, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people transgress. Ye make the Lord's people transgress. Ah, Eli. If you knew that, that they make the Lord's people transgress, do something about it. Take them away from there. Remove them from here. Eli said, no, I cannot. I fear my children. I don't like the frown of my children. I'd rather face the judgment of God and face the judgment of my children. Well, but let's look at Samuel. You will be a Samuel. Somebody there said you will be a Samuel. And the child Samuel grew on. And it was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. And at the right time, God promoted Samuel. At the right time, he will promote you. But don't put your hand in any evil thing. Don't say, I'm still a young person. I cannot take my stand. I'm still a young person. I cannot, you know, fight against sin. I'm still a young person. I cannot stand against sin. I cannot be pure when my seniors are impure. Why not? Look at Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 11. Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure, a child, whether his work be pure, a little one, whether his child be pure, a growing Samuel, whether his life, his work be pure, and whether they be right. Of course, you can be pure. You can be pure. You'll be pure in Jesus' name. We're coming to Psalm 51. Psalm 51, we're reading from verse 6. Psalm 51, verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with Esau. If as you pray every time, after getting saved, you keep on praying, Lord, keep me clean. Lord, keep me pure. Lord, keep me holy. And then you are sanctified. After you are sanctified, Lord, keep me pure. Keep me purged and keep me perfect. Don't allow me to go into all the things that I see around. Purge me with Aesop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. He will do it for everyone. I said he will do it for everyone. But now, you know, we live in a compromising society. We live in a society that looks at what people are doing, and then it's like people say, I cannot stand. I cannot stand alone. You will stand. The Lord is with you. You will stand. Underneath you are the everlasting arms. You will stand. One with God is in the majority. And you are not alone. I said you are not alone. Uh, One thousand people around you, they are not equal in strength and power in influence to God alone. God is greater than a million people. If there is no human being with you, after all, human beings are weak. But if the Lord is with you, you are in the majority, God will keep you pure. Look at First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 22. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 22. Lay hands suddenly 
or no man, neither be partakers of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. And you know, there are too many yes men in many churches, even in our church. There are many yes women in many churches, even in our church. They do not know how to say no. The people who are living in sin, they're looking for associates. They're looking for approval. They're looking for people who will tell them, it's all right, it's all right. Who am I to tell you you are not all right? You're my senior. You're a senior woman. You're a senior man. You've been here before me. And you're ahead of me. Well, even though you know your heart, is not living right. She's not living right. Who am I to say that? And you are a partaker of other men's sins because you are a yes man, a yes woman. You cannot keep yourself pure and say, I cannot approve of that. I cannot say yes to that. I cannot smile at that. Whatever they call their name, whatever height, whatever height they have reached, here I stand. You will stand in Jesus' name. Keep thyself pure. I will say that is what Samuel did. He saw them. He knew them. He kept himself pure. We're looking at Psalm 24. This is what it takes to get to heaven. Purity of heart. Psalm 24. We're reading from verses 23 and verses 3 and 4. Psalm 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully Matthew chapter 5 Matthew chapter 5 I'm reading from verse 8 Matthew chapter 5 verse 8 blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God I pray you will see God here on earth you will see God and when your eyes close over here and you open your eyes on the other side you will see God. How the Samuel remain pure in that community, in that situation. How can you remain pure? No stain, no blemish, no defilement. Whatever is happening around you. Number one, passion for purity. Passion for purity. Samuel urged a driving passion for purity. He said, like people have passion for money, they have passion for prosperity, they have passion for property, they have passion for other things, Samuel had passion for purity. And that's what you should have in your life. To say, whatever else I lose, whatever else I have, I have passion for purity. Number two, prayer for purity. It's by prayer. This is not what you do by yourself. Cleanse me, purge me with Esau, and I shall be clean. You offer prayer. You offer it now so you can have the instantaneous experience of sanctification. And after that sanctification, after that holiness experience, you keep on praying to remain pure. Number three, possession of purity. You don't say, okay, I prayed. Whether God has done it or not, but I prayed, I prayed, I claim it. You must possess. There, there must be that cleansing. There must be that purity that you know. He has made you, he has washed you white and then snow. Number four is the peacefulness through purity. 
Uh, have you noticed that Samuel did not argue with any of those uh, children, Ophni or Phinehas? Did not get into any confrontation with them. He was a peaceful child, not a pugnacious child. He had peacefulness through purity. He said, they are my seniors. I can't fight them. They are my seniors. The Lord has not placed me on them to be their policeman. And so he had peacefulness through purity. Are you peaceful in your life? Are you pugnacious? Are you always fighting? Are you always colliding with this and colliding with that? Be peaceful. That's how you are going to preserve the purity. If you are a fighting, con contentious person, you are not going to be able to keep purity apart. Number five is the preservation of purity. Year after year, month after month, that young man remained stable. His purity was preserved. He didn't say, I'm at a height now. I think I should stop praying. I think I should stop seeking the Lord. I think I should seek, I should stop the pursuit that I'm making, number six, is the pursuit of purity. Pursuit of purity. I need more. I want more. As the days go by, as the challenges grow, as the children of Naya and Feso are becoming worse and worse, I need more of the purity to shield and to shelter me. The pursuit of purity, the preference for purity. It would have had a chance to exchange purity for another thing. Samuel, you see what we do? We have pleasure, free, no charge. Can we introduce to you how you can have pleasure too? I prefer purity preference for purity you know in your life in your office in your community people will try to offer things to you but if you have a preference and you say no what i want is purity how i want to live is a life of purity my commitment is to purity and whatever it is, even if somebody offered himself, herself to you, you can do whatever you want to say. No, I have a preference for purity. Number eight, the propagation of purity. You don't want that purity to just be in your little circle. You want to move on and you want to present and preach and proclaim that purity to other people. Partnership in purity. You don't have partnership with anybody for any reason, for anything impure. And they say, you know, this is the only man that knows how you can make progress in your place of work. This is the only woman that knows if you link up with her, this is the only way you can have any progress at all. Uh -uh. If she is impure, bye-bye. you will rather lose progress in the place of work, rather lose anything property, rather lose partnership with people who are progressing then lose your purity you have your partnership only in purity number 10 is the power of purity as you look at the life of samuel when the children of israel said hey, look at us the Philistines are coming he made sacrifice as he was making the sacrifice thunder came from heaven and discomfited and disbanded and destroyed all those Philistines. Purity has power. And then number 11 is progress through purity. The progress that Samuel made and the life that he lived and the things that he achieved because of purity. And you know, eventually, if you're going to get to heaven, paradise, paradise through purity. Without purity, without righteousness, without holiness, heaven will be impossible for you. The gate, the door will be open. Paradise through purity. And I pray the Lord will keep you pure. Look at First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. 
And we're reading from verse 15, First Peter chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15, verse 15, verse 16. It says, But a sea which has called you is holy, is pure, the same thing. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Look at verse 22, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. You are purifying your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with what kind of heart? A pure heart fervently. In First John chapter 3, First John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. I pray every one of us will be pure. By the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb will be pure. By the grace which is above every challenge and every temptation will remain pure in Jesus' name. Point number three now is solemn commission and courage as a prophet preacher. A solemn commission and courage as a prophet preacher. In First Samuel chapter three, First Samuel chapter three, we're reading from verse seventeen. First Samuel chapter three, verse seventeen, and he said, "What is the sin that the Lord has said unto thee? I pray thee." I did not from me. As the Lord has raised up to be leaders, workers, ministers, we need to be so faithful that whatever the Lord has told us about the sinner will not hide it from them. About the backslider will not hide it from them. About a weak believer will not hide from them. About a fellow brother, a fellow sister will not hide from them. About our relatives will not hide from them. We are servants of God and we're preachers of the truth. And our first loyalty is to God. Our first commitment is unto God. We cannot love the sinner more than we love God. We cannot love the people we're preaching to more than we love God. We must be so faithful. We declare the word of the Lord as God has given to us. Eli said, what is the sin that the Lord has said unto me? I pray thee, hide it not from me. Don't hide the truth. Don't hide the gospel. Don't hide the word from people who need to hear. Verse 18, and Samuel told him every week, every detail, every area, every scene, the whole truth. And he hid nothing from him. Verse 19, and Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. He has to be with him. A faithful child like that, a faithful worker like that, a faithful minister like that. And he did not let any of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan, even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord, a preacher of the word. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel 
in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Let's see now how Samuel fulfilled his responsibility in declaring the mind of God and the word of God. For Samuel chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 3. For Samuel chapter 7, verse 3. And Samuel speak unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts. What else could he preach? He preached the word of God faithfully. And he told them, You return unto the Lord with all your hearts. Then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you. Samuel did not pretend that he didn't know what the children of Israel were doing. Just preach his superficial message that didn't touch the sin of the sinner, the idolatry of the idolater, the adultery of the adulterer, the fornication of the fornicator, and the search of the seed, and the wickedness of the wicked. He didn't preach a message that was flowing, floating in the air. He was direct, and he said, Put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord. He didn't allow them to just continue with head religion outward religion he said the lord is asking for your heart prepare your hands unto the lord and serve him only and serve him only and serve him and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the philistines he was telling them your commitment should be unto the Lord and unto the Lord alone. Your devotion, your consecration, and your devotedness should be unto the Lord and unto the Lord alone. You see, that's the kind of preacher God needs today. That's the kind of worker God needs today that will let the people know that God must be number one, must be all in all, and be all sufficient in their lives. Then the children of Israel did put away Baalim and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. It was not a wasted effort. It was not a wasted ministry that Samuel had. Samuel told them and the people immediately in the next verse, they responded. I pray people will respond to the word from us in Jesus' name. If we're serious preachers, if we're dedicated preachers, if we're not people that people, other people know that when well, that's how he talks, he just talks, he himself is not straightforward, he himself is not righteous, he himself is not holy. If we're not like that, if we're totally devoted to the Lord and they know, it will be easy for us to tell the people to repent and they will repent in Jesus' name. And Samuel, and Samuel said, gather all all Israel to Mispe, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mispe, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and they fasted on that day, and said there, we have sinned against the Lord when our message can lead the sinner to repent and to repent sincerely from their heart and from the death of their being and Samuel judged the children of Israel he misbehaved he put things right he corrected them and when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to misbehave the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel and when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. In verse 8, and the children of Israel said unto Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a sucking lamb 
and offered it for a bunch offering holy entirely unto the Lord and Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel and the Lord heard him the Lord will hear you if we preach what he wants us to preach, the Lord will hear us. If we are not afraid of the face of the sinner, the Lord will hear us. If we lead many to righteousness and we lead them to serve God and serve him alone, the Lord will hear us. And, Sam, and as Samuel was offering up in verse 10, the bunch offering, the Philistines had drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they was meeting before Israel. God will use you to smite all the things that were contrary to the people of God and to your members in Jesus' name. And the men of Israel went out of Mispe, and they pursued the Philistines, and they smote them until they came under Bethka. And Samuel took his stone, and he set it between Mispe and Shen, and then called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto, as the Lord helped us. Look at verse 13. So, the Philistines were subdued. Philistines will be subdued in our ministry. And the enemies of your life, of your ministry, will be subdued in, me, in Jesus' name. And the Philistines against our nation will be subdued in Jesus' name. So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the course of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. Tell me what you'll find there. Tell me, tell me, tell me. All the days of Samuel, all your days, the Lord will keep enemies of your congregation under in Jesus' name. He'll put them under subjection. And you will be on top. And the people of God will be on top. Look at chapter 8 of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 10. 1 Samuel chapter 8 verse 10. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that had asked him for a king. Didn't hide anything. Samuel was known as telling the whole truth and preaching the whole word and hiding nothing you know what i was talking to eli one person i was talking to all the people he told them all the words of the lord look at verse 21 in verse 21 and samuel heard all the words of the people and he rehearsed them in the ears of the lord he told the Lord everything the people said. He told the people everything the Lord had said. I pray God will give us that faithfulness. Chapter 10 of First Samuel. First Samuel chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 9. First Samuel chapter 10 from verse 9. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. That's talking about Saul. Samuel had spoken to Saul. And when Saul was leaving, the Lord performed a miracle of transformation. He affirmed and confirmed the word of Samuel. He will confirm your word. There will be transformation as a result of your word unto the people in Jesus' name. For Samuel chapter 12. For Samuel chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 20. For Samuel chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 20. And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet... Turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. 
consistency in his message. That's what I said before. Sir God with all your heart. Don't turn aside to the right or to the left. He repeated the same thing unto them. Serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside. For then should ye go after vain things. Which cannot profit or deliver. Not deliver for, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people. For his great name's sake. Because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, as for me, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. He said, if I didn't pray for you, I'll be committing sin because God has made me a prophet, a priest. I take your case to God. I take the cause of God unto you. And then he said, but I will teach you the good and the right way. He was committed to teaching the good and the right way. And I pray the Lord will give us, will give every one of us the same commitment in Jesus' name. But you know, Samuel, he also raised up other prophets. He didn't just, you know, stay as a faithful prophet, as a dependable prophet. He raised up others as the Lord is bringing you here and training you. You will also go back to your locality and train other people. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 19. We're reading from verse 20. 1 Samuel chapter 19. And we're reading from verse 20. It says, and so sent messengers to take David and when they, when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing over them, appointed over them. The Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. I pray that all these qualities we have heard, we have learned, we have taught today about Samuel will be reproduced in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Samuel had a commission. You have a commission. He was a prophet. You are a pastor. You are an overseer. You are a preacher. And really, he was a courageous preacher. Without compromise, without fearfulness, he condemned sin. And that's the same calling God has given us, that anywhere you go, you stand firm and you stand clear. You condemn sin so as to get the sinners converted in Jesus' name. Him. He confronted Saul. You know Saul, and you know the character of Saul, but he was not afraid. He confronted Saul. He taught the nation with the saving truths of the word of God, and he preached repentance to the people, turn away from Ashtaroth, turn away from Bealim, turn away from idol, turn away from corruption. He brought conviction upon those sinners. In the following verses were told they repented and turned to the Lord. He led many to conversion. He led many to restoration. And he trained other people too so that they too can have a preaching ministry and a prophetic ministry. And the Lord confirmed his message was signs following. The Lord will confirm your message was signs following in Jesus' name. And the same courage and the same manliness that God gave to all these ministers, Samuel in particular, the Lord will give you. Are you there? I said the Lord will give you. Joshua chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5. Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you. I will not forsake you. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto these people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous 
that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, has commanded you. Turn not from me to the right, to the right hand, or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Is it you there? This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Thou shalt meditate therein. Everything you have heard tonight, meditate day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. It's confirmed in your life. It will be done in your life. Remember Samuel, how he grew from uh, a simple, being a simple convert to spiritual giant. Don't remain a grasshopper. Grow up, you'll be a giant in the Lord in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and take everything we have learned to the Lord in prayer. And let the Lord affirm, let the Lord confirm everything in your life today. That Lord, you brought Samuel, young Samuel, little Samuel, child Samuel, from that little age, and you brought him to the height of um, progress. Lord, do the same thing with me, he will do the same thing with you. And you grow from being a simple convert to being a spiritual giant.